सब्सक्राइब टू आर चैनल एंड हिट द बेल आइकन सो दैट यू नो वेन लाइव वी गो There is an article in today's newspaper a push for the semiconductor industry see the semiconductor industry is facing acute crisis presently globally there is extreme shortage of semiconductor chips and this shortage has been persistent ever since covid-19 pandemic broke and later because of us china rivalry and the russia ukraine conflict These have led to blockages of the supply chain of semiconductor chip industry. There are multiple industries that depend on semiconductor and supply of semiconductor chips, the microprocessors which are brain of any electronic device. So the shortage will have a major impact on global manufacturing industry and consequently on an entire economy. it is also extremely important in this context to take note of the imf prediction of a global slowdown coming in and in this scenario if semiconductor industry largely the microprocessors and the semiconductor chips if that does not fall in place early on then that may make the global slowdown even worse let's begin from the beginning semiconductor is a material that allows for electrical conductivity which is between that of a conductor and an insulator meaning semiconductor by design allows for electrical conductivity which is not as high as a conductor and also is not as low as an insulator the conduction through a semiconductor can also be controlled by various techniques you know what is most valued in life is control in this entire scheme of things its control of electrical signal which is so remarkable because a semiconductor material defines the conductivity and a semiconductor chips basically controls the electrical signaling and by control of electrical signals information is imparted and that is also imparted by the advanced design at very high rate and that's why the semiconductor chip they become brain of any electronic gadget semiconductors are made from mixing impurity into pure elements of silicon or germanium they can also be made out of compounds of pure elements for example gallium arsenide this compound can act as a very good semiconductor the process of mixing impurity into pure element is called as doping and the extent of doping decides the extent of conductivity semiconductors they have really revolutionized the entire electronic industry semiconductor equipments makes the brain of the gadget smaller and smaller and hence the entire device these days are becoming more and more compact they are highly efficient they are less expensive and they are very powerful powerful in electronic terms means they can emit strong signals semiconductor chips they can be thumbnail sized and they are the building blocks of almost all modern electronic devices anything that needs to communicate anything that needs to process any information that could be your mobile phone your toaster your oven lift smart bicycle anything any small device that needs to process any piece of information that has to have a microprocessor microprocessor essentially is a semiconductor chip and you know with the advent of internet of things everything is going to come online different gadgets will need to communicate with each other and the central server so each one of them must have a microprocessor a semiconductor chip of their own but however making a semiconductor chip is a highly complicated process it is also highly exact So manufacturing a semiconductor chip is no easy task. It is a very very specialized job. You see one microprocessor could be of size of your finger nail and one microprocessor will have thousands of thousands of semiconductor chip. There are semiconductor chips of nano size. So making a specialized material of this size has to be a specialized job. It is complex. It requires large investment. so it requires a skill and it requires capital so it won't be found everywhere the supply chain is very very concentrated it's concentrated in east asia with semiconductor manufacturing in japan south korea and taiwan 
very few countries of Europe like Netherlands and US. There are few countries like Germany which are emerging as a semiconductor manufacturing market. But these countries alone, they control 90 to 95 percent of the supply chain of semiconductor manufacturing. The market dominance is also extremely concentrated. Very few companies, they tap on around 90 percent of the revenue. There was one estimate done recently by the New York Times estimating that 90 percent of five nanometer size chip, they are mass produced in Taiwan. And that too by one single company, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. Let us now look at the significance of semiconductor manufacturing industry. See, when you have to write significance of any topic in science and technology section, you begin with the technological significance itself. Any technology that must be connected in one way or the other with other technologies, like blockchain technology. Blockchain technology is inherently connected with cryptocurrencies. It is the bedrock of Web 3.0. Similarly, artificial intelligence cannot function without machine learning, without big data analytics. So if you have to give significance, you begin from technological significance. That's a good point to start with. So what's the significance of semiconductor manufacturing? It will help in technological development. Semiconductors, in fact, today, they are the building blocks of any technology. They are used in computers and laptops, mobile phones, any electronic gadget, in automobiles, in aviation, in medical devices, in military equipments, everywhere. They are the drivers of ICT. They are going to become the foundation of next electronic revolution in the form of Industry 4.0. After writing the technological significance, you come to economic significance. You go to other sections of GS Paper 3. So you look at the significance in economy, significance in environment, significance in security. Then you come to GS Paper 2, significance in governance. Then you keep hovering to different sections of your GS syllabus. What's significance in society? Is there any geographical significance? What is the ethical significance of this technology? Likewise, you cover five to six sections. See, what happened during COVID-19 pandemic was the demand for the electronic equipment, automobiles, these decreased. So the companies, they were also projecting for the future purchase of chips in lower numbers. So in turn, the manufacturers of chips, they were producing less. And in countries like Japan, they have a concept of just in time to reduce the warehouse costs, etc. They do not keep piling things up. So they have a defined timeline for the entire process. And just in time, things are produced. Just in time, they are transported and just in time, they are used. The production that decreased during time of COVID-19, they have not come back to the pre-COVID level because there are different stages in the production of a microprocessor, of a semiconductor chip. From design to manufacturing to testing, there are many countries involved. It is only manufacturing that is concentrated. The design is not concentrated. The design happens in other countries and most of the companies, they have R&D presence in India as well. So design and testing is done everywhere. Supply chain of the entire semiconductor chip is very long. The supply chain of manufacturing is very short. So from the stage of formulation to design to patent to manufacturing and then testing, it's a long supply chain. Once broken, it's very difficult to set things up back again, especially in the context of present US-China rivalry and Russia-Ukraine conflict. There is continuous disruption in the supply chain. So to have certainty to certain companies that have dependence on imports, we need to have manufacturing of our own. Countries producing semiconductor chip, they do not have problem of disruption of the supply chain. Semiconductor and the ancillary technology of display, they have multiplier effect in the economy. Not only in the electronic industry, but also in aviation, also in automobiles. It has huge bearing on the smartphone assembly industry where India is very strong. And then you talk about the general parameters of economy. For example, you talk about the employment generation. You talk about the forex reserve. You talk about export. You talk about import bills. According to Electronics and IT Ministry, semiconductor demand in India will increase to 70 to 80 billion dollar by 2026. This is a huge market to capture for India. It will boost economy and will have a multiplier effect as well. 
then you can come to other sections like you can talk about governance in general both public sector and private sector the culture of work from home this has got popularized and this will have irreversible effect this is going to stay but this requires better gadgets better internet connectivity cloud computing cloud storage facilities better servers and all these things can be advanced if semiconductor research ecosystem thrives then you can talk about international relation you must have been reading in news that government is going on a spree of banning the chinese apps because there are security concerns similarly the 5g company of china they have been banned in uk and many european countries because of security concern the 5g equipment that chinese companies like huawei they provide there are serious security concerns in them so if we have our own semiconductor manufacturing facilities those concerns will be put to rest second the disruption of supply by china in the eventuality of conflict like the one we had in the galwan valley that won't arise so china will not have unnecessary leverage in the geo strategic issues and then you can go to the other section like for example the security section of gs paper 3 there are of course security concerns there are critical infrastructures like communications power transmission recently there was blackout in maharashtra we have our nuclear facilities they are also working online and everything is controlled through microprocessor that's the brain of any electronic equipment so how is india exactly doing in semiconductor manufacturing as we have noted earlier that semiconductor manufacturing this does not have a long supply chain countries like japan south korea taiwan usa netherlands handful of these countries they control the entire supply chain although india has done well in design and testing and most of the global semiconductor manufacturing companies they have their r&d footprint in india but there is a big but but there is no manufacturing in india there is no commercial manufacturing of semiconductor chips in india 100% of our chips the memory panels displays they all are imported and 37% of the import comes from china the import bill presently is 24 billion dollar and this is going to rise to around 100 billion dollar by 2025 according to the estimate of ministry of commerce we have two fabrication labs i told you there is zero manufacturing but we do have two fabrication labs one is called as sitar this is a unit of drdo and there is another semiconductor fabrication lab in chandigarh but these fabrication labs they build semiconductor chips for strategic purpose not for commercial use so i told you that there is zero manufacturing for commercial use so now you understand it's a matter of concern government of india has tried certain things but it has not quite worked out very well yet national policy on electronics 2019 it has the vision to place india as a global hub for electronic system design and manufacturing since it was a policy so exact schemes and procedures were not laid down here there's a scheme called as a scheme for promotion of manufacturing of electronic components and semiconductors specs there's a provision of financial incentive of 25% on capital expenditure and government has given a list of products which are part of supply chain of global electronics market so it has electronic equipments that includes semiconductors that also includes the display units and other things government of india under this scheme will be offering 1 billion dollar 1 billion dollar to any company that will set up a manufacturing unit in the country but so far there is no taker for this you know why because setting up a manufacturing unit costs around anywhere between 3 to 7 billion dollar so even if government of india gives 1 billion dollar which is huge sum of money the amount that the company will have to put in will still be extremely high under modified electronics manufacturing cluster there was a plan of setting up electronics manufacturing cluster and common facility centers where the supply of water and electricity and other inputs for the manufacturing of semiconductor chip will become easier but this also had so far limited success there is one very important scheme production linked incentive scheme for manufacturing of semiconductor units 
Here, government used to provide 4 to 6 percent incentive on goods manufactured in India that will include semiconductor manufacturing as well. Recently, there has been a very important change that government has made under this scheme. Earlier, center was offering 30 percent of the total cost of production for 45 nanometer to 65 nanometer size of the chip. So a company making semiconductor chip of this size range will get 30% subsidy of the manufacturing cost. And for the chip size of 28 nanometer to 45 nanometer, government had a plan of 40% incentive. Similarly, there was a plan for 50% incentive for the size 28 nanometer and less. But under the modified scheme, there is a uniform 50% subsidy for all nodes, for all sizes of semiconductor chips. And you must also know that government already has allowed for 100% FDI under the automatic route in electronic system design and manufacturing sector that will include semiconductor design and manufacturing. But despite these incentives given by the government, Private sector participation and the foreign companies' participation to establish any manufacturing unit in India has not seen any advancement. As we have discussed, that it's a costly affair. Around 3 to 7 billion dollar it requires to set up a manufacturing plant. So even if the government gives 1 billion dollar, still the rest of the money required is very very high. India still has low ease of doing business. There are technological constraints Making a semiconductor chip of nanoscale requires very high, very advanced, very sharp laser technology for instance. There are many high-end technologies, there are technology required to make alloy of silver, very very pure, ultra pure. All these technologies are patented at very very high cost. Getting these technologies adopting or indigenizing is not an easy task. The ecosystem that requires for manufacturing has not been developed. For instance, the ancillary technologies, they are patented and, and they are not commercially used in India. Even the fabrication facilities are not there. India has done a decent job in chip design, but manufacturing and fabrication is not done. We do only assembly of different parts and then the testing of the entire equipment. There are some structural basic issues. For instance, FDI in electronics is less than 1% of total FDI flow. And there are generic fundamental things, the issue related to land acquisition. There is uncertain tax regime as well. There is uncertainty in policy of government. You must be reading in newspapers concerning the spectrum that government will use under 5G technology. And that has thrown the airline companies on the unknown road. You must be aware that airlines also work in the same spectrum bandwidth. So there will be interference and there are going to be problems. In the beginning, we saw that the semiconductors work with impurities and it's the impurity that decides the conductivity and that impurity has to be put in a very, very controlled manner. So everything in a semiconductor manufacturing plant has to be controlled with regard to their concentration. Even the waters which are used there, they have to be ultra pure. And generally in other countries, it's the job of the government to supply these ultra pure water. These basic facilities they are not available in India yet. So what shall we be doing? Government first of all should support the research which is already happening with adequate funds. IIT Madras for instance has developed a microprocessor called as Moshik. This has been done with the funding support from the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. Such kind of support and hand holding should go to other institutions as well. Focus should not be just on manufacturing. We should focus on our own niche areas. We have considerable talent and experience in design. So maybe initially we should strengthen this part of the ecosystem of design, testing, packaging. And then slowly and gradually the ecosystem will expand itself to cover manufacturing as well. There is a suggestion that the government should have a sovereign patent fund. This fund should be used to buy technology for indigenization of those technologies which will be crucial for setting up of a manufacturing plant. Government of India can work out an arrangement like Quad Supply Chain Resilience Fund to make the supply chain more resilient or rather immune to any kind of disruption because of any geopolitical or geographic risks. As we have discussed earlier, many technologies would be required to manufacture semiconductor chip like radar, like lidar, like phased array technology. 
These are easy to advance in. The entry barrier is very less. So we must create an ecosystem that helps develop the parts and the latter the parts can combine to develop the whole. And the whole that we are looking towards is a microprocessor. To make a one tiny microprocessor, huge amount of effort and too many technologies needs to be developed. So we can start step by step developing each one of them individually and later the ecosystem will take care for combining these technologies together. The government of India also needs to give assurance for minimum domestic procurement so that in the initial stage the manufacturing plants they become viable. Just like the kind of support the renewable energy enjoys, the same kind of procurement promise has to be done by government of India in this industry as well. There also has been a suggestion that Indian businesses they must be given support for rather than setting up a manufacturing unit in India, they must be supported to acquire semiconductor manufacturing units in other countries where these are already up and running and then slowly and gradually the technologies can be brought back home. India and Taiwan they have started negotiation for free trade agreement. The agreement is also about setting up a semiconductor manufacturing hub in, in an Indian city. This first of all must be expedited and such agreement India can also get into with other friendly nations like Japan. There is an article on page number 12, Cuba grants nod to same-sex marriage after doing an unusual referendum. Situation back home is actually far away from this. Some time back, there was a petition in Delhi High Court to recognize the same-sex marriage under the Hindu Marriage Act and the Special Marriage Act. This petition was filed in the court after the same-sex marriages were not being recognized by the government even after Supreme Court decriminalized the consensual homosexual acts. After the petition was filed, the Delhi High Court sought the opinion of the center and the center opposed changes to any existing laws related to marriages. Section 377 This erstwhile section was part of Indian Penal Code it used to make sex or marriage with persons of same gender a punishable offence under law. But in 2018, Supreme Court in Naftet Singh Johar case decriminalized consensual homosexual sex, effectively striking down Section 377 of IPC. But mind you, entire Section 377 was not struck down. Section 377 also had provision for making bestiality as a punishable offence and that has remained intact. The central government has submitted in the Delhi High Court that any interference with any marriage laws will cause a complete havoc in the delicate balance of personal laws in the country. They have said that living as partners and having sexual relationship with same-sex individuals is not comparable with the Indian family unit concept. In the concept of Indian family unit, there is a husband, a wife and children and this concept necessarily presupposes that a biological man is the husband, a biological woman is the wife and children are born out of their union. Registration of marriages will also become problematic because if you go to register your marriage, you will have to prove that ceremonies and rituals were done in the marriage unless it was a court marriage. And the traditional ceremonies and rituals cannot be done in the same-sex marriage. So the center has submitted that all statutory provisions will become unworkable. It is also their contention that in the 2018 Naftet Singh Johar case, Supreme Court decriminalized homosexuality. But the stand of the center is that this judgment, it did not legitimize homosexuality. It only decriminalized it. Recognizing same-sex marriage will actually legitimize it. However, there are many Supreme Court judgments which actually has laid the foundation for the same-sex marriage. In the Putta Swami judgment, the constitutional bench declared right to privacy as a fundamental right. Right to privacy was made part of right to life and liberty. UPSC in 2018 has asked in the mains exam, what is going to be the consequence of this judgment? Putta Swami judgment has been the pot from where many judgment took roots. 
Adhar judgment is based on Putta Swami judgment. Hadia judgment was also based on the Putta Swami judgment. Navtej Singh Johar case can also be strongly linked with Putta Swami judgment. Because privacy of an individual recognizes an inviolable right to determine how freedom shall be exercised. And choosing one's partner, that's also part of liberty under right to life and liberty. So any intimate act and matters related with marriage, they all are covered under privacy. So they all are fundamental right. In the Hadiyah judgment, Supreme Court observed that intimacies of marriage lie within the core zone of privacy. The choice of a partner, whether within or outside marriages, lies within the exclusive domain of each individual. Supreme Court already has recognized living relationship as good as marriages. In one of the judgments last year on interfaith marriages, Supreme Court observed that matters of dress and of food, of ideas and ideologies, of love and partnership are within the central aspects of identity. The court further said, society has no role to play in determining our choice of partners. Supreme Court reiterated the stand it took in Shabri Mala judgment and other judgments previously. It said, the constitution protects personal liberty from disapproving audiences. The social values and morals have their space, but they are not above the constitutionally guaranteed freedom. These are very important observations of Supreme Court from various judgments that you must put under your belt. In Shabri Mala judgment, Supreme Court previously has said that individual freedom prevails over perpetrated group rights. Individuals cannot be forced for social conformity. Individual freedom, liberty, choice of partners, intimacies under marriages, they all are part of fundamental rights. And hence, although not explicitly said by any judgment of Supreme Court, these observations naturally lays the foundation for same-sex marriages. There is an article on page number 5. 10% EWS reservation is a fraud on the constitution, says Justice Chandru. Justice Chandru is a retired judge from Madras High Court. Well, this is his personal opinion. You must be aware that a case on 10% reservation for the upper class, a case on 10% EWS reservation is already under consideration in the Supreme Court. So we have to form our opinion on the issue based upon the Supreme Court judgment. Or if at all you have to differ from the majority judgment, you can take the opinion of the minority judgment or the dissenting judgment. But if there is a consensus in the judgment of the Supreme Court, so by and large, you must go with the opinion of the Supreme Court, at least for the purpose of civil service examination. The final discussion on this we will have after the judgment is given by the Supreme Court. But at this stage, I must discuss with you something which anyways seems important from the perspective of polity and governance. Previously, Supreme Court has raised doubt on 10% reservation, especially the criteria for giving reservation. Supreme Court has raised doubt based on the doctrine of reasonableness. So we will first discuss what this doctrine is. And then we shall discuss recommendation of a committee that the central government appointed to check on the reasonableness of the criteria for the 10% EWS reservation. See, Article 14 says that state shall not deny any person equality before the law or equal protection of the law within the territory of India. Equality before law as provided in the Article 14 of our constitution provides that no one is above the law of the land. You must have heard the quote, be you ever so high, the law is always above you. Rule of law is an inference derived from Article 14. Article 14 aims to establish equality of status and opportunity as embodied in the preamble of our constitution. However, Article 14 does not mean that all laws must be general in character or that the same law should apply to all persons or that every law must be having universal application. This is basically because all persons are not by nature or by attainment or by circumstance equal in position. Thus, the state can treat different people differently if the circumstances justify the differential treatment. 
Also, the identical treatment in unequal circumstances would amount to inequality. Thus, there is a necessity of a reasonable classification. And this reasonable classification is considered as important for the society to progress. Supreme Court has maintained that Article 14 permits reasonable classification of persons or objects or transactions by the state for the purpose of achieving specific ends that help in the development of society. However, there has been argument from various quarter that the extensive use of reasonable classification as a tool for development by the state and its approval by the Supreme Court has rendered the guarantee of fair and equitable treatment within the scope of Article 14 as illusory. So here comes the role of test of reasonable classification. The test of reasonable classification says that the classification must be based upon intelligible differentia. This intelligible differentia differentiates or distinguishes person or things that are grouped from others that are left out of the group. Meaning the classification must be done in an intelligent manner. The differentiation must be rational. There should be a relation between the differentiations to the object of the classification. There must be some kind of relation between the basis of differentiation to the objects or persons who have been classified into a particular group. Fundamentally, it means that there must be a criteria. That criteria must be reasonable, rational. So classification must be done in an intelligent manner. The concern that Supreme Court has put forward was that for OBC creamy layer reservation, the cutoff gross annual income is 8 lakh. And the same amount was put forward for economically weaker section as well. So 8 lakh for OBC creamy layer and 8 lakh for EWS both. This does not seem reasonable to the Supreme Court. Hence, prime FSI, the action of the state was seemingly arbitrary. Let's now look at as to what was the criteria for classification of people into EWS category. As per the notification that Government of India gave in January 2019, a person who is not covered under the scheme of reservation for SCs, STs and OBCs and whose family family has a gross annual income below rupees 8 lakh are to be classified as EWS for the benefit of reservation. But there is some exclusion criteria as well. For example, if that family owns 5 acres of agricultural land and above, then they are excluded from EWS criteria. Similarly, a residential plot of 100 square yards and above in municipalities and 200 square yards and above in other areas will be excluded from the criteria. There was a third exclusion criteria of 100 square feet of residential flat anywhere. You must note that family here would include the person, his or her parents. It will also include spouse and children under age of 18 years. Income of brothers and sisters will not be taken into account to calculate the ceiling of rupees 8 lakh gross annual income. But income of the person, spouse and parents income will be counted. And income includes all income, salary, agricultural income, business income, professional income for the financial year prior to the year of application. So there are three things here. First of all, this income of rupees 8 lakh annual gross income. Then there's a criteria of agricultural land and there's a criteria of residential plot or residential flat. And concerning all these three, there was a sense of arbitrariness. So the expert committee that center has set up has discussed all these three criteria and made modification to justify the reasonableness of the classification of EWS. The expert committee has defended the criteria of rupees 8 lakh gross annual income. It has reasserted that this should be the eligible criteria for the benefit of EWS reservation. The Supreme Court has prima facie observed that applying the income limit of rupees 8 lakh. This essentially is the income limit for OBC creamy layer. So applying this criteria to economically weaker section was unreasonable because EWS has no basis of social and economic backwardness. But the expert committee has opined that this criteria is reasonable because it appears to be the same for OBC creamy layer and economically weaker section, but they are applied very differently in different contexts. For EWS, as we just have discussed, 
the criteria relates to one financial year the financial year just proceeding to the year of application whereas the income criteria for trivial year in obc was applicable to gross annual income of three consecutive financial years so the safety net for obc trivial year is higher than ews for deciding obc trivial year income from salaries agricultural income and traditional artisanal professions was excluded whereas in calculating rupees 8 lakh for ews all incomes are included including farming so rupees 8 lakh for a person falling in ews criteria would be quite different from a person falling in obc creamy layer criteria and hence it's a reasonable classification that's the opinion of the expert committee we have to wait and see what opinion supreme court forms on this opinion the expert committee also gave various logic as to why this rupees 8 lakh criteria is reasonable first of all in the definition of income criteria for ews agricultural income is included and the agricultural income does not attract income tax so there's a practical problem in estimation of income and considering the income tax reforms wherein effective income tax on individuals was zero for those with annual income of rupees 5 lakh but however taking advantage of various provisions for deductions savings insurance etc the tax payer may not need to pay any tax to annual income in the range of rupees 7 to 8 lakh so taking maximum benefit of tax incentives individuals earning up to rupees 8 lakh may not pay any income tax and people not paying income tax must be counted as belonging to weaker section so for this reason this number 8 lakh has not been plucked out of thin air it has not come out of the blue there is a reason there's a rationale behind it The expert committee also has defended the exclusion criteria based on the agricultural land. A family who has five acres of land and above shall be excluded from the EWS classification. See the argument that the expert committee has put forward is that there is paucity of information concerning agricultural income because it is exempted from income tax. Also there is a lot of variability in the agricultural income depending upon the geographical location, the soil type, the climate and other factors. so it would practically get very difficult to objectively set a criteria of different amount of lands in different region we might have to apply supercomputers and quantum mechanics maybe for that but if we do not have an exclusion criteria then there will be inclusion error and if we do not have a reasonable number like 5 acre then there will be exclusion error So to minimize the inclusion error and the exclusion error the expert committee has defended this exclusion criteria of 5 acre of agricultural land concerning the residential asset criteria as an exclusion criteria the committee has recommended for removing this criteria in the opinion of the committee it is not an easy task to specify a general residential area threshold for the entire country because essentially that will require lakhs of candidates every year to get the valuation done of their houses and the plots further the committee also said that if the residential house was used only for dwelling and not for income generation then that essentially should not be used as an income criteria so here's a summary of the recommendation of the expert committee given to the central government and central government has said in the affidavit to the supreme court that it's going to accept the recommendation the family income limit for ews classification of rupees 8 lakh per annum gross will be continued the exclusion criteria of 5 acres of agricultural land and above will also be continued but the residential asset criteria may altogether be removed now we'll have to wait and watch what the opinion of supreme court comes regarding the reasonableness of these criteria there's a lead article on page number 6 pitching india as a signature destination the article is based on the potential of india as a tourism destination i am not discussing this article with you because a very solid notes on this has been provided in the focus magazine of july very comprehensively covered the potential the challenges concerns initiatives taken by the government of india and suggested measures they all are provided in the magazine i would suggest you do a quick reading of that section from the magazine tourism is a very important part of economy it becomes a very important topic for the mains exam